Hello, my name is Judith Klein, for maybe the half of you that don't know me. <laughs> um, I'm from Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand. This is my third DevRel. Oh, more people drifting in now. Yeah, so my name is Judith Klein. I'm from Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand. This is my third Dev World and my second time as a presenter, and so I'm excited to be here again. I'm currently doing my honours year in the Creative Technologies degree, and I started learning iOS development two years ago with very minimal programming experience. So it's been an exciting journey so far, and AUC have played a huge role in getting me where I am today. Just to make sure you're all in the right place, this is programming for mobility. I don't know if they've gone the signs fixed, but this is programming for mobility. I'm going to talk to talk about location awareness in iOS apps and the bigger picture around how to really utilize the inherent mobility of the platform. The code I'll introduce is aimed at beginners, but for anyone more experienced in the room, which there's a few of you I know, uh, hopefully you should still be able to get something out of the bigger picture discussion. Uh, which may be a new way of using location yet and thought of before. A lot of these ideas are linked into what I've been doing for my research, and so I have sort of technical iOS understanding which has been informing that. So that's what's inspired this topic for me. So just to get an idea, who's reasonably new to iOS development? Oh, excellent. <laughs> um, is, who's used a core location frameworks before, for those of you who aren't new? Oh, good, a couple of people, um, so I can point out any of my mistakes. Um, I talked last year about a similar topic on location awareness and ways to tap into the existing geotag content. This talk is more broadly about the affordances of working on a device that is inherently mobile and how to utilize that. In terms of the coding, as I mentioned, I'm going to look more specifically at the core location framework and then some other related frameworks as well. But the overall talk looks at the relationship between location, mobility, context, and what that means for mobile apps. Yes, location awareness. So during this presentation, I am first going to look at why location awareness is important and what it means for iOS apps. This is more of the bigger picture conceptual stuff. Next, I'm going to talk about making your app context aware, which means looking at some typical use cases, or this means looking at some use cases, and discuss how you can make your app different. Go beyond simply um, knowing where the user is and how to use that information to enhance user experience. So this looks at some of the underlying technology, introduces some code which focuses on the different information you can get, um, not just about the user's location, but about their movement. So this isn't just location, it's movement as a whole. Uh, so then next, and some code. Yeah, next I'm going to look at making your app Yep, so I'm, I'm very aware that this is an afternoon session, so you're all probably going to come down with 3.30-itis. I don't know if you use that term here. Uh, you've probably already crammed a lot of code in your head and maybe starting to think about dinner, so I feel you've all had lots of coffee. Uh, so I'll keep this section as painless as possible. And finally, look at some of the challenges of being context-independent. So I'm looking at this balance between context-aware and context-independent. Uh, the challenges associated not just with location awareness, but the other considerations you have to take into account when dealing with mobile devices. Start up with some best, practice, best practices and hopefully some time for some questions. Yep, key considerations, best practices. So, what do I mean by mobility? We live in a technological age defined by the mobility of people and knowledge. We move around a lot more, travel various distances to be here, spend our lives going from A to B to C to D, and back again. Devices such as the iPhone and iPad are inherently mobile. They're small, thin, light, have long battery life, and have the wireless internet connectivity. We know this. The affordances which come from its physical shape and size can be, com combined with hardware and software features make it a really powerful tool. Network capability in combination with location technologies can provide a seamless experience between your device and the real world. It provides essentially a viewpoint into the world. And I think my slides are in the wrong order. The wireless networked enabled device is designed to be used on the go in many different places and locations. And it's not just about the tangible features. When you're programming for a mobile device, you, it is important to consider the huge social and cultural role they play. They're personal, intimate, and ubiquitous. They're always on and always with us. If you take a moment to think about the Find My Friends app, 
Really, you're not finding your friends, but you're finding your friends' devices. We can make the logical connection that the device and the, and the person are in the same place. You can safely say that at any time we have a geographic location. And to tap into that is to harness something that is fundamentally personal and powerful. Our lives are intrinsically tied into our devices. Location awareness is not just about where you are, but what happens when that location changes. With a desktop computer, with a device, with a desktop computer, it is likely that its location won't change. With a laptop, you might be working from different locations, but it is, but it's likely, more likely, you're not going to be moving around while you're using it. I, I know some people do, but usually you just kind of take it with you and use it in different locations. With the iPhone and iPad, it is likely your user will be moving around a lot, and there's a lot you can do with that information. When I started developing for iOS, what I, was, I became really interested in how the mobile device changes how we interact with the, world, with the physical world around us. It offers us new ways of engaging with spaces, content, and other people. With the rise of computers, there's always been kind of that inherent fear that it's going to make us mean we're spending more time indoors, staring at screen, and the screens are becoming more antisocial and engaging with each other only through purely digital means. But with the rise of the mobile device, I feel we are actually going in the opposite direction, where we are able to actually take everything with us and have everything with us on the go. And this also means we interact with the world on a much broader scale. This has brought about a much more ambiguous sense of location where you can communicate with people in remote places and collaborate. That's one of the really powerful new ways we have of engaging with each other, collaborating in real time. And previously, um, so you can work and communicate with people you might never meet or ex experience places you might never be able to travel to. Previously, your community would have been predominantly defined by your physical where you were physically located in the world, and maybe how far you could walk to see people, obviously or the rise of cars and things, you could travel a bit further. And now we have, all we've done is we've essentially overcome the constraints of time and space. You can interact with anyone, anything, anytime, anywhere, or well, pretty much. And I'll talk about some of the limitations and challenges a bit later. It's your viewpoint into the world. Uh, so what it comes down to is, now that we can do anything, uh, what can we do? Perhaps before that, the first question we have to ask is, why is it beneficial to make an app location aware? What can we gain by knowing where the user is? What I want to emphasize during this talk is that location is more than just dropping a pin on a map. Core location and MapKit, um, two frameworks, often go hand in hand. But the real power of location is in its ability to provide context. It gives the user a more personalized and seamless experience, and it makes your app seem a lot more intuitive. By knowing where your user is, it can provide information about who and what is nearby. Maybe bus stops, people, restaurants, um, maybe if your friends nearby, your tweets, your Foursquare, your find your iPhone if it goes walkabout, uh, getting directions, which are very good if you're very directionally challenged like me. Um, with ne nearby restaurants and cafes, the weather. So you can just, you don't even have to say where you are, you just open it and tells, tells you the weather is horrible or lovely. Finding people. So it's seamless because you don't have to tell the app where you are. It's, you're skipping that extra step, the extra hurdle of saying, I am in Preston. Um, it can just automatically present the relevant context, the most relevant content. These are simple examples of what you can do with location awareness, and you've probably seen all these before. They're very useful, very handy, but I feel that we are only just starting to tap into the potential of what location awareness can do. Having a user who is mobile enables new, ca new use cases of technology. A couple of weeks ago, we had uh, one of the learning tours by Apple in Auckland, and they talked about a model that's more applicable for uh, the education context. But so it's called the SAMR model, and looks at different ways to integrate technology into teaching and learning. But I think it can actually be applied on a wider scale to think about what you can do differently when you're develop with apps you develop. So with any kind of app, it looks at the different stages of how technology enables both enhancement through trans transformation of tasks. 
So at the most basic level, the technology acts as a direct substitute with no functional change. So for example, using maps on your iPad uh, versus a paper map. When you integrate location awareness, it begins to augment the experience by adding functional improvement. It can show you where you are, update your movement in real time, provide information about nearby physical features and landmarks. Well, technically a paper map can do this as well, but it gets outdated a lot more easily. Uh, so that, that is really when we start to get into the modification. So those functions only enhance the experience of that task of looking at a map and finding where you are. When you start to bring in data relevant to that geographic context, you begin to move into the transformation and redesigning of the task. A traditional map would not have been able to give you access to the vast amounts of geotagged virtual content that have, that have evolved. Uh, bring in the virtual content. So new use cases have evolved from that added functionality. What you want to aim for is that top tier, that redefinition. I'm sure everyone has had the argument at some point, as we all like our Apple toys. And so it's, it's an argument that the iPad is just the same way to do, just a new way to do what we've always done before. It's just another way to read a book or, to, or watch a movie or things like that. And really, in the initial stages, that is what it is used for. But once you start moving into actually redefining what those tasks are by bringing in those affordances of the iPad, that's when you really start moving into creating tasks that were previously inconceivable. And that's where you begin to move into apps beyond the apps, only off that logistical value. So you don't have to carry around a map and unfold it and or carry around a pile of books. And so you can offer, you begin to create apps which Apple calls magical. So start to tap into that magic. So now we know that it's more than just about just being location aware. It's be about being context aware, knowing what exists in the world around your user. Again, obvious examples are the physical features, so landmarks, street buildings, but there's also that incredible amount of geotagged media that's been rising as we have devices that know where they are and can add that location to it, um, often without you even thinking about it. So again, photos, videos, uh, Facebook, Twitter, audio, all that beautiful rich media that we can access and carry around with us in our pockets. As with any technology, the more people use it, the more useful it becomes. As there's more geotagged virtual content, there are more opportunities to digitally augment the physical space. Again, um, augmented reality is becoming one of those things that's becoming more and more known, and that really does start to tap into using your physical location and then just overlaying that rich media on top of it. Because iOS devices are able to connect to the internet, you can leverage that to access more abstract and dynamic content. So again, with the paper map, it becomes outdated very fast. But with, with your digital content, you can access the, this, however much information is always being uploaded to the internet, it's some scary numbers, and you can pull all that into your app. And why not just, and so the other argument is that the iPad is just another way to consume. So why not create? It's a, the iPad is a way to, and the iPhone can create content. So create your own geotech content, put that out. Of course, if we want to do all this and to crawl before it works, so first we have to find our user. So how it works before we look at the code, it's good to have an understanding of the mechanics behind it. So how does the device know where it is? So when you get into coding, you know why you might be getting a different value or behavior to the one you're expecting. This is why it is especially important to test your location-aware apps on devices in the real world. The simulator can, obviously, can simulate location and movement, which is great for testing apps in areas you can't get to. But there are many other influential factors, and I'll talk about this later in the presentation as well. When people think location awareness, you usually think GPS. And in reality, some devices use up to three different positioning methods. First one being cellular. So the, if you have a device that's connected to a cellular service, it checks to see which cell tower you're connected to and gives you an approximate location. It's the least accurate positioning method, but also requires the least power. The second is Wi-Fi positioning. The device scans for nearby Wi-Fi access points, and from there it can give you an approximate location. More accurate than cellular and still relatively low powered. 
Uh, some new updates in iOS 6, they've actually made Wi-Fi even more powerful, and I'll talk about that a bit later. And then there's your global navigation satellite systems, such as GPS. There's uh, another satellite it uses, one of the Russian ones, I think. In, in reality, some, so this is your most accurate one. It gives you the most accurate positioning, so that's when you have the, pin, the pinpoint accurate one that follows you around. But it's also the most power intensive, and of course, if you're indoors, you can't see a satellite, and then so it can't use it when you're indoors. It's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking you need GPS, you need the most, powerful, the most accurate position, and this isn't always the case. Also, you can't actually specify which of these methods you want, you want to use. Your app makes the decisions for you based on some of the parameters you specify in your code and what is available to the user at the time. Maybe what hardware they have, if they're only on an iPod Touch or Wi-Fi only iPad. Wi-Fi only devices obviously can only use the Wi-Fi positioning method. So when you're asking for your lo user's location, you set the desired accuracy. So you have location accuracy best for navigation, best, nearest 10 meters, 100 meters, kilometer, and three kilometers. It's, so GPS, so you can guess which technologies it will use, but you can't control it. So you can imagine if you ask for the best, the highest accuracy, you can, it's gonna be using GPS. If you want something that's lower powered, it's gonna be asking for the cellular tower. But you can't actually say, I want you just to use this one. So GPS isn't the be all and end all, and if you have a genuine reason, but if you have a genuine reason why your app needs really needs GPS, you can specify this in your info.plist file to prevent users from downloading your app onto devices that do not support the capability. One very important thing that I said before anything else, uh, which is usually important, it's a good thing to point out, I said it last year, um, and then in the demo after mine it happened. Um, it is important to import, it's very important to remember to import the core location framework into your project. Uh, it sounds redundant, but you are surprised how often it happens to the best of the coders. Um, but for now, yes, yeah, so that's some of the things you have control over. The other thing you can set is your distance filter. So this is the minimum distance the user must move before an update is generated relative to the previously desired location. So that all plays into how, what technologies it uses. So at the very root of it all, essentially what you're doing through your code is you, you want to find out something about what your user is doing in the world and then do something with that information. There are a few questions we can ask, such as where is the user? What's their heading? Has the user entered or left a specific area? Which direction are they facing? How is the device being held and moved? And all these answers provide value, valuable information to utilize. So first up, where is, our, where is our user? Where in the world are they? <coughs> the core location framework provides the ability to determine where you are in the world geographically. There are two different location services you can use to do this. The most commonly used one is the standard location service, and this is supported across all devices. Start by creating a location controller. It's gonna manage location for your application. Waiting to find some horrible typos in there. Um, and but first you have to check, make sure your object doesn't already have one. In, initialize the CL location manager, set yourself as a delegate so you get the callbacks. And you see the two variables we set earlier, the desired accuracy and the distance filter. So then it, decides, it can decide which positioning methods to use for you and which hardware to power up. Then it's out to start updating location and from this information it determines yep, which radios you want and proceeds to report location events to your app. To receive the updates from a service, uh, I'm going to show you two ways to do it. The one shown here, did update to location from location, receives a callback that says the user has moved from the original position to a new one, so you can take appropriate action and do something uh, like get the coordinates of that new location or update some data. This has actually been deprecated with iOS 6. The new delegate method, it's First part's all similar, but when you receive the update, what you want to do, what it does for you is it puts the locations into a chronically, chronologically ordered array. So if you're not handling the location updates as quickly as they're being sent, it, you just take the, it just takes the last value in the array, the newest one, so you don't, and discards the rest, so you don't waste CPU on outdated data that's not gonna be worthwhile. So that's the one you want to use. Um, the other option you have is the significant change service. 
So, which is pretty much what it sounds like. This determines that uh, the user's location is going to be, it's going to be using the cellular radio. And so as we discussed, this is the least accurate, as the cell towers can be fairly far apart. I know probably some places in New Zealand, if you drive far enough, you probably don't even get cell phone reception at all. Um, and so if the user is moving around, a change in which tower is connected to is going to be considered a significant change in location. It's a very similar process to do this, except this time you call start monitoring significant location changes, and you don't need to specify the accuracy of the distance filter, uh, sorry, determined which technology it's going to use. So that obviously saves some power with that. Sign region monitoring, uh, another common use case is maybe when you're only interested if your users in a specific area or when they leave a specific area. Region monitoring lets you set up a geographic boundary, also known as a geofence. If you've ever used a location-based reminders in the Reminders app, it's the exact same premise. Telling your app, when I leave this location, leave this region or enter this region, do something. You can register multiple regions which continue to be tracked even if your app's not running. So essentially you create a coordinate which becomes a center point, set the radius in meters, and from that you can you create the monitor, the region to monitor and start it. Easy. So what else can we do? The core location framework gives you more than location. It can also give you direction related events, which can be defined in terms of heading or course. Heading requires the device to have a magnetometer which reports to the di which direction the device is pointing. There is a slight difference if you want to know the actual direction the device is moving as this is independent of the device orientation. And this is defined as course and uses the GPS. So if you're driving and you want to know which direction your user is driving in. Again, if your app relies on knowing this information, this is something too you can specify in the info.plist under UI required device capabilities that your app requires a magnetometer or a GPS to run. Geocoding, with some of these APIs, uh, some of this code we've been looking at so far, what you'll find, well, you always find is the device, how the device understands location is in terms of coordinates defined in latitude, longitude, altitude. So often it's, use, it's probably useful to translate that into something meaningful. Reverse geocoding converts latitude and longitude coordinates into an address or other, another meaningful label such as an address, oh, an address or a business at that address. Or the other way around, if we want the device to understand a string of text, we can forward geocode to convert an address into a coordinate. So then the machine can, the device can understand it. So this is useful if you are dealing with maps and you want to reference physical feature, reference features in the physical space. MapKit, as I said, tends to go hand in hand with core location for when you want to display the user and relevant context information on a map. So maps do have their place. Um, I want you to use it in more interesting ways. Um, but essentially, MapKit gives you a lot, of, a lot of things for free. You can drag a map on to your interface, uh, add things like annotations, call-outs, overlays. And it's also really easy to display the user's location with the simple shows user location property. The good news is as well that with the change from Google Maps to Apple Maps, uh, there's no API changes for the MapKit. So any existing apps made with MapKit automatically work out of the box on iOS 6. So if you're running iOS 6, you would have already seen that any maps, any third-party apps that had maps in it, they automatically just have the new Apple Maps, which everyone loves. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the other hardware, some of the other hardware, which I have touched on already, uh, use, you can use hardware to respond to context as well. So again, it's not just about where your user is, it's how they're moving it, how they're moving the device. The Core cool Motion Framework lets you receive and process data from the accelerometer, gyroscope, and magnetometer. Again, depending on whether your user has a device that has these hardware in it. Some of this is actually already utilized in core locations we saw before with heading, but that's handled for you. Similarly, similarly if you specify that your desired location accuracy is best for navigation, behind the scenes, it uses location data in combination with sensor data. You get a very precise location, as you would want for navigation, but it takes into account, again, also how the device is moving. Um, but it is very power intensive, and it assumes that you're a navigation app for a car, and that the device is hence plugged into the car. 
and charging. The core, the core motion framework gives you more control over what kind of movement you're interested in. So you have several different types of movement, quite a lot of different types of movement you can get. Um, so as a, yeah, it's not just about mobile, where your user is, but even within that location. So I could be standing here and holding my device a different way and holding it differently here. And it's, it's about how it's moving. It's going to be moving in 3D space. And so with a combination, the main idea is that you're dealing with a mobile device. And with a combination of the different frameworks, um, there's so much more you can do with that information. With a desktop or a laptop, you're not likely to be waving it around. Um, that usually doesn't end very well unless that was your intention anyway, um, to destroy it. Uh, so some of the things I've started to touch on in this part do begin to lead into the second part of the presentation, which is some of the more important things you need to keep in mind when you're creating location-aware applications. So, seems easy enough so far. Um, find your user, do some with the information, but there are, of course, challenges when dealing with a platform that is inherently mobile. Especially if the nature of your app is one that will be used while your user's moving around. The challenges aren't just those associated with location awareness, but things you also have to consider with power and data. So, mobility means portability means batteries. So, it is so important to respect that because the user might be out all day and they want their battery to last them a whole day. The battery life on iOS devices is pretty good, unless maybe you have a 4S. Um, but asking for a high level of loca location accuracy does put a huge strain on the battery. When you're designing your app, it is really important to consider what information you need and always ask for the minimum. Ask for the minimum level of accuracy, ask for location, ac location updates only when you need them, and turn them off when you're done, if you don't need them anymore. Consider using the Significant Change service, which offers a significant power savings and provides accuracy that is good enough for certain use cases. Running in the background, um, you probably don't need to. It is very demanding on the battery, so think very carefully about it. Situations that would want to run in the background are things like fitness applications and nav navigation. With iOS 6, Apple strongly encourages you to specify your activity type. So, no, activity type. So you have uh, vehicular navigation, fitness, or other. So this is new with iOS 6. And so then, once you when you specify that, uh, they can do some work for you under the hood to help you out if your app goes into the background. So this works with the new what's called the new Auto Pause API, which is one of my later points. But region monitoring is for when you want to make it look like you are running in the background. It's for situations where you don't need to know where your user is all the time, but you're only interested in that one area. So when you, if you define the geographic area to be tracked, you can give your app the, the appearance that it's running constantly because you respond to that application even if your app isn't running. So auto pause. It, it's important to know what to do because, again, your user, we know they're out and about, but it's also important to know what to do when they stop. Uh, when an application goes into the background while location updates are running, it actually becomes pausable against a set of criteria. So this is the auto-pause API. The location manager uses this information in this property to determine whether the location updates should be paused. The main idea is to decide whether the updates are draining the user, are draining the power without really benefiting the user. For example, your app, if you're a fitness app and your lo user's location hasn't changed in a while, perhaps they've gone home and forgotten about it and thrown it down, in which case it really is no longer beneficial to keep updating and because it's getting the same value over and over again. Or maybe it's, it can't get an accurate fix and it's searching or it's getting the same value, then it also becomes plausible because it's not worth it to keep updating that location when it's not giving a worthwhile value. So this is where it's important to specify activity type. Uh, if you specify activity type behind the scenes, it does decide um, whether or not the updates are beneficial. So that's something that they do for you behind the scenes. When it's paused, stop updating location is called, and you have two options. You can either resume the location updates when the user 
remem remembers you and they open up again and application comes back into the foreground. Or you can just clear up the pause state entirely and leave it up to the user to restart the location updates themselves. So maybe if they go back to it the next day and they go, oh, I forgot to turn it off, they can just start it again manually or clear it and start a new, new one. Auto pause is enabled by default in iOS 6 and Apple recommend that you leave it on and that you specify your activity type. So those are some of the main things to consider to optimize your, bat your user's battery life. However, that's not all. Portability also means mobile data, and it is highly likely that if you do want to give the users some of that context to their location, you'll need to get some data that is stored on the internet. To do this, you'll have to familiarize with some aspects of networking, and as it's all about the transfer of data and is a central part of iOS functionality. Um, Networking is hard. Apple says so themselves in some of the um, resources I looked at, even they always say networking is hard. Um, it's a fundamental issue that can't be fixed at the API level. There's a whole raft of issues you have to deal with and you have to architect solutions for. Uh, packet problems, bandwidth, latency, asymmetric connectivity, mobility, security. IP address can change, connectivity comes and goes. There's just so many things out in the environment you can't control, especially when it comes when you have a user who is mobile. Apple uses the term mobility uh, in the context of networking as a generic term to cover things an application needs to handle the dynamic nature of the network. Essentially, connections will go down, packets will get dropped, timeouts will occur, and you just have to handle these situations. It's one of the major challenges of a highly mobile world. Uh, anything and everything about the network can and will change. I'm not going to talk too much about this because it's a, it's a huge topic. Um, I have some resources at the end that uh, the Apple engineers recommended to me. Uh, essentially, you just have to adapt to a network that is, you, you just, the main idea is you have to work asynchronously. So there's a very good um, session earlier today about locks and GDC, which addresses some of that. Um, and the network, the network is fundamentally asynchronous. Things don't happen in the order that you want them to. Um, you can't control the order that things happen on the internet, you just have to adapt to it. Mobile, mostly important too, mobile data is expensive. In New Zealand, it's hideously expensive. If you're roaming, you might have a user who's roaming, then it's even more, more hideously expensive. Uh, New Zealand, I think it's something like $20 a megabyte if you're roaming. Um, so don't, don't ever assume that the network your user on is free or cheap. Uh, 3G is obviously fee-based. Fee um, if you've got a user who has 4G, that downloads and chews up their data even faster. Uh, so even, even if they're on a Wi-Fi con connection, it could be coming from a 3G backend. Um, so when you're writing an app that you know will be used by someone on the go, you do have to respect the limitations of mobile networks. But in saying that as well, also equally important are Wi-Fi devices. Consider users who have a Wi-Fi iPad or iPod Touches. Don't dismiss the potential of the humble iPod Touch, um, and because to do so is to ignore a huge potential market of users for your apps. Consider caching data and supporting an offline mode. With improvements to location awareness in iOS 6, it is not even an excuse to say that they don't give you the accuracy you need. Under the hood, they've introduced something called Wi-Fi tiles. So, with the Wi-Fi positioning method, it does a scan, see what's nearby, see what Wi-Fi access points are nearby, determines your location from that. Um, so what they've done with iOS 6 is they've, they've concentrated a lot more of these into these 5 km by 5 km tiles, so that when you're connected to uh, Wi-Fi, it downloads a bunch of these nearby tiles. So if you move quite a lot out of this area, it still has a lot of these tiles stored across the map, so that it can still you can still get your location for if you're a Wi-Fi device. And because they have the new vector maps as well, usually if you're in a car or you're moving on a, uh, or if you're moving at a decent pace, it can look at that vector map and assume you're not running all over the road and that you're probably running in a straight line or driving in a straight line, not driving through buildings. And so that's one of the benefits of the new maps. So use Design your apps for Wi-Fi only devices as well. Uh, no. Testing. You
probably a lot of the present a lot of the presentations today we talk about testing. Testing is important, very important. Um, so your app's finished and polished and you think you've done everything right. But how can you be sure? So last year Apple introduced location simulation. Previously, it always just took you to Apple headquarters um, in the simulator. And so now it's actually really handy that you can test your location aware applications without leaving your chair. You, do, you can do this by, it has a few preset areas that you can go to, or you can also generate what's called a GPX file, which is a bunch of Latin long coordinates, and it then it simulates the user moving between these points. So this is very useful for um, maybe places you can't get to. Um, but keep in mind that use, your users will be using devices, not simulators. And so this goes with any app that test in the real world, test on devices, you don't know for sure how it's going to behave in areas of limited connectivity or non-connectivity. And quite possibly, you're going to find that um, you're not always going to get the accuracy you want. You're not always going to get the connectivity you want. Um, your device might not have the right features. In areas with tall buildings, you get what's called an urban canyon uh, that blocks signals and makes it hard to get an accurate position. Your user might walk into an un underground car park or an elevator and just drop off. Or, as I said, you could be driving along New Zealand and just drop off the map. Um, the stars might not be correctly aligned. There could be a cat in the way of your signal, anything. Mm -hmm. You just don't know. It's a scary world out there, and that is why um, you expect the unexpected, be prepared. It might take a while for your app to locate the user or get a network connection or download any data you need. You need to make sure to engage your user as soon as the app launches. Uh, engage them up front, have something ready to go so you're not sitting waiting. We are the generation of the Twitter attention span. So if they wait too long, and long isn't a very long period of time, uh, they're going to kill your app. Engage your user, hide any delays and or network problems as much as you can. Before you ask for things like heading or significant location updates, there, are, there is code that you can run to just check that they have the supported hardware. Uh, again, you can specify some of those in your info.plist as well to stop them downloading it in the first place if they don't have the hardware on the device. And to do a check, make sure it supports it. Make sure they have location services enabled. It's reasonably important. And have a plan B. Have, let them be able to have an offline experience. Let them interact with your app. Um, just gently let the user know that something isn't quite right. Um, and why things have gone wrong. Prepare for scenarios also where they might, the user might not initially trust you with their location because really the user is always in control. Location is always considered personal and private on iOS and so you're at their mercy. They can take it away from you any time either by turning off location services globally or specifically on your app. To the user they're sharing a very precious piece of information for, with you. Uh, I don't know if, if you've ever asked someone, hey, can I add you on Find My Friends? Like, no. Or when people find out about Find My Friends, like, that's a little scary. Um, people can see where you are. But so it's, it's very precious, and you have to be very clear why your app wants to, use that wants to use their location. Help the user make an informed decision with permission dialogues. This used to be done with a property called the purpose string, which has been deprecated. So you know, it's now something you need to include in the info.plist file again under location usage description. So be very clear why you, why you want to use your location. If you have come up with something that's really clever and really different um, and you've transformed some sort of aspect of location awareness, they might not understand why you want to know where they are. Uh, so they might be really c confused why you're asking for it. So give them the option to change their mind if they don't initially grant you permission. If possible, let them interact with your app, even if they haven't granted the permission. So those are the key points. Power, run the background, monitor region if you don't need for when you don't need to run the background, consider data, tell Apple what you're doing so they can help you, support an offline experience, support, support Wi-Fi devices, test, 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 and uh, respect the privacy. So. What does this all mean? We live in an exciting time. 
I, um, when I began my undergraduate degree in 2009, it's been said that by the time you finish your degree, uh, the careers that will exist then don't exist now. And sure enough, only into my second year of university, the iPad came out, and that's what changed everything for me. Um, then knock that out. The world changes fast, and the iOS platform is actually still really relatively new. Even with the 700 or so apps on the App Store, we are still just starting to tap into the true potential and answer the question, which I'm sure you've gotten a lot, is, what is what, what's a device for? What, what do I do with this thing? Shove it in the filing cabinet. Um, location awareness is one of those features I feel does start to tap into the transformation stage of technology, enabling us to create tasks that were previously inconceivable. Even our understanding of what place and space and location are shifting in the highly globalized world that we live in. We don't think about location purely in terms of physical measurements anymore. We think about it in terms of time, data, pixels. Um, if someone asks, people ask me, oh, yeah, how far away is New Zealand? It's like, oh, it took me four hours to get here. So I don't say however many kilometers, it's, it's time. How long does it take to get somewhere? And, and even now that we have these instantaneous communications, it's the physical proximity almost becomes neg negligible. Uh, the same way, location, so location is no longer just about the physical world. Don't think about just what's in the physical space around them. Uh, think about what, what are these abstract features that relate to concepts of place. Think about shared places, virtual and physical. Think of augmenting that space, adding something to it and encourage content creation as much as consumption, and that's when you start to make, start to move towards transformation. Let them do something they've never been able to do before. It's all about user experience, and as Apple always says, magical. So I've covered a few things. That's, oh, I think I'm right on time. Um, covered a few things. Talked about why location is important. It can provide more than just a user's location on the map by providing context. The software and hardware affordances of the device make it a viewpoint into the world. When you have a user who is mobile, it enables new ca use cases that weren't previously t possible on a desktop or a laptop computer. So keep this in mind. And as the keynote speaker this morning was saying as well, you don't just port your, laptop, your Mac application onto the iPhone. or So design very specifically for what this device lets you do that you weren't able to do before. Um, so make your apps transformative. Do something that was previously inconceivable. We looked at a bit of code and um, what functionality you have available to leverage. Um, we looked at, looked at some of the challenges of the mobile world, things that you can't fix at an API level but you have to find solutions for. And take home, my take home message is that we live in a dynamic world and the mobile devices offer a way to bring this dynamic content to your user whenever, wherever. So there's a lot more they didn't have time to fit in. Um, and so there's some resources that I found really helpful. There's a location awareness programming guide, which is probably easier just to look it up in the documentation library. Um, it takes you through a lot of the different methods and variables and everything you need to know, it has some tips. Um, there's the WWDC session from this year, staying on track with location services. Um, if you have your developer account, you can log in and download those. and they talk a lot about the new the Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi wi tiles and the new advantages with that. Uh, there's a really good one last year about testing your location aware apps without leaving a chair. So that's a lot about um, the location simulation, and um, and it even talks a bit about localization. And even this this is what the the Apple engineers recommended to me when I went to them saying, "Hey, I want to do this with networking, and I don't know how to start." Um, Network apps for iPhone OS part one and part two. Uh, it's not even too badly outdated yet, so it's really good. And it's, I think the presenter is an Australian, so I was watching it for half an hour before I realized why it was so strange. It didn't have an American accent. Um, so it's a good, those, those are really good ones. Uh, so for me, with not a lot of experience with networking, it helped me start to get my head around some of the base concepts. And other than that, that's me, and uh, I'm here through a conference. I can take any questions now or come talk to me and enjoy the rest of DevWorld.
Thank you.